Hi, my name's Darren King from Bag Press, and what I want to show you today is how I go about laminating guitar sides using heated moulds in a vacuum press. Um, I'm going to walk you through some of the equipment that I'm using today, and then I'll go on to the construction that we'll be using and the adhesives and so on and so forth. Um, first of all, we have um, a small frame press to show you. Um, this is a, a solid laminate bed machine with a, um, a polyurethane membrane on it, which is actually welded up as a three-dimensional box. I don't know which image is best for that, that one probably. So th this, this membrane actually has height engineered into it. Um, so I'm not relying on the material stretching to go over the mould. Um, the, the excess material is already there. Um, now the advantage of that is that you never get anything other than atmospheric pressure being exerted on what's inside the bag. Whereas if you have a stretchy membrane, it ha where it stretches over the side of the mould, for instance, you not only have atmospheric pressure, you also have the additional pressure caused by the tension in the membrane material. Um, another advantage of using a box membrane is it means your press can be smaller because you can have, you can have a mould in the press all the way up to the inside of the frame, up to the height of the membrane. Whereas with a flat membrane, obviously if you had a mould, say 250mm high, the, the, the frame needs to be considerably bigger to allow that material to stretch over it. Um, so all in all, you know, we, we do a lot of manufacturing using vacuum pressing and all of our frame presses are fitted with box membranes. Um, and you know, that's, uh, um, from a production point of view, it's by far the best, the best system for the type of work that we're doing. Okay. Now, the other bit of kit that we've got is obviously the vacuum pump right here. It's a, a four cubic meter per hour vacuum pump. It's a dry running rotary vane machine. It has a um, little vacuum gauge on the top so you can see what sort of level of pressure you're getting. And routinely these will get up to about minus 85% atmosphere. So you're talking about eight and a half tons per square meter of pressure being generated by, by that little pump. Um, very, very low maintenance. Um, they have something like 4,000 running hours between changes of the little carbon blades inside. So it's really not something you have to pay any attention to. Um, there's no oil, no nothing, just completely dry running. Great little bit of kit. So it's connected to the underside of the frame, on the underside of the bed rather than the frame, um, to a manifold. And then, I don't know if you can see, but along here, there are little holes in the bed, which is where the air actually gets sucked out from. Um, I've also got two studs here in, in the bed, and they're actually the electrical connections for when I connect up the heater pad. So we've got the wires coming out, going to a little lab, lab power supply there. show you this is a set of um, parts that I made earlier on today using bird's eye maple. Um, so I've got bird's eye maple on the outside, just plain maple on the inside, and then the inner layers are cross grain maple. Okay. Now there are different constructions you can use. The original Macaferry guitars had decorative veneer on the outside, most often um, rosewood. Um, they had mahogany on the inside, and then the central core layer was um, poplar um, or tulip wood. Um, and that, I believe, was a single layer of 1.2 mil thick, something like that, which gave just over a 2 mil thickness, 2, 2.2 mil thickness to the, to the finished sides. <clears throat> now, the, the ones we're going to make um, shortly are going to use poplar on the inside. Um, there's quite a lot of experimentation that can be done using different core materials. Um, whether you want to use the same material all the way through, which will give you uh, some kind of a single resonance fre resonant frequency for the part, or using a, a, a different wood as, as the core will tend to dampen that resonance down because the two materials resonate at different frequencies so they cancel each other out. There's a lot of experimentation. Um, you can speak to a hundred guitar makers, they'll all have their own <laughs> their own theories and that'll, that'll tell you that they're right. Um, but what I would say is uh, try it out 
you know, experiment, see what you like. Um, I've got a, a guitar maker as a customer in, in Germany who laminates his sides up to, you know, four and five mil thick, but he's, but he's trying to achieve something entirely different from his instruments. But, you know, there, there's no one way to do this. Um, I prefer using, um, uh, if not the same veneer on the inside, then at least something that's a, a close species match. So here we've got the bird's eye maple on the outside, plain maple on the inside. The Macaferis, like I said, had mahogany, but what you've got to remember is that when they were built, um, certainly the Grombush, the, the original ones with the big D, D sound hole, um, they had this second resonator box in, inside them, so you couldn't really see much of the inside of the guitar. Um, but I just think it's a nice touch to have a, a similar type of veneer on the inside. Now, you can see this veneer here, I'll put it on the overhead again. This veneer here is just stunningly beautifully figured. Um, and that's one of the things you'll find if you start laminating, laminating guitars, is that the quality of the veneer that you can find relatively easily is far higher than the quality of solid wood that you can, you can purchase. Um, the reason for that is veneer like this is expensive. You know, not compared with solid, but it's expensive. Now that means that when they, when the, the fellas, the, the tree fellas, not the two fellas, the tree fellas, find uh, a tree that has got this type of figuring in it, it automatically gets sold to the veneer cutters because they know they can get more money for, from it. Um, so I'm not saying you would never find solid bird's eye as pretty as this, um, but it would be pretty rare and it would be very expensive. Um, and the other thing about certain veneers, uh, certain solid woods, especially bird's eye maple, is an absolute nightmare to bend um, with, a, with a bending iron. Whereas you can see here, even on the very tight, even on the very tight bend um, on the cutaway, the cutaway side, um, the, the quality of the, uh, the, the veneer, the surface is, is absolutely first class. There are certain ecological benefits to using veneer as well. Um, when veneer is being cut from a, from a log, it's cut with a big knife. That means that there's very little wastage. So, you know, for every 10 mil of material, you end up with a stack measuring 10 mil of layers of veneer. If you're cutting blanks for a guitar, for guitar sides, for instance, that are being supplied at maybe four, four and a half mil thick, that's going to have been cut with a blade that is probably three or four mil thick. So you're losing almost as much material in dust as you're, 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 you're ending up with as your, your guitar side blank. The guitar maker is then taking that down to two, just over two, maybe two and a half mil. So again, you've got another 40% loss there. So for every 10 mil of material, you know, you're losing 70% of it in, in, in wastage. And that, that's not the case with veneers. I say knife cut veneers is a very, very efficient way to use um, rare and valuable um, and increasingly rare um, resources. Now, you know, you, you could argue that if all the Rio rosewood that had been, uh, that was in the world at one stage had only ever been used as veneer, it may still be readily available to us now as instrument makers. And you will find over, over the coming years that the availability of the exotic species that, that luthiers have, have been used to having as their, so their, their staples for, for making guitars are going to be are going to become increasingly difficult to find, increasingly expensive, and more and more of them are going to be CITES listed, um, which is an absolute nightmare for everybody. Um, so using veneers opens up a huge range of um, options to you as guitar makers to, to use some extremely beautiful woods that you, you probably just can't find as solids in um, suitable sizes for, um, for guitar making. Um, Right, so I'll put these down for now. This, this here is actually the wood we're going to be, we're going to be using today. Um, this is figured sycamore, and again, you, know, you can see that the, the tightness of the, the, the fiddleback figure on this is just astonishing. It's absolutely stunning wood. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is actually stunning for veneer. Um, you know, so it, it's... It's not impossible to find it. It's reasonably expensive, but it's just such beautiful, beautiful wood. Um, and then the central layers are going to be made up of cross-grain, cross-grain tulip wood. Um, 
or poplar. This is a very standard um, core material. This is what they used in the original Macafarias um, made in Paris in the 30s, 40s and 50s. Um, and this has been made up actually of three sections of veneer, which I've edge glued together. Um, now, edge, edge gluing veneer, edge gluing veneer might sound like um, a bit of a nightmare job, but it's actually very, very simple. And I'll be doing a separate video um, on how to do that um, later on in this series. Um, but if you if you can edge glue a soundboard together, you can edge glue veneer. It's almost the same process. Um, and it's always better to, to glue the veneer together rather than just leave it in individual pieces because that way you, you ensure that you don't get any voids or, or, or gaps when you're laminating the, the guitar side. Okay, so what other kit we've got that we're going to be using? Well, I'll show you this. In fact, tell me what I'm going to do. I'm going to give myself a temporary workbench on top of this press. So I've got a few things that I need to prepare. It's easier just to do it on top of that. Okay, so there we go. There's my, there's my temporary workbench. Right, okay, so I've got my workbench. This is the glue spreader that we're going to be using. And what I'll do is I'll show you how that goes together by assembling it. Um, basically you have the, the main body of the, the glue spreader itself, that's where you're going to put, put the glue. Um, you have what's called the transfer roller, um, it's a little metal knurled aluminium roller. That goes down inside, you then have the trigger mechanism, that goes on the outside, and then you screw these pins in, like so. Put one on each side, and they, they form the spindle for the for the transfer roller. You can see that it's now able to spin around. And then lastly, you put the um, the rubber roller in. It just pushes down. You can see this pushes down and fits in that slot. And then you, you've got up and down travel on, on the glue on the um, roll and that's important because when you're when you're wanting to spread glue you pull the trigger and that allows the rubber roller to make contact with the transfer roller and that means you you're putting more glue down onto the onto the substrate. If you lift it up and let go of the trigger the roller stops at that point and it's not touching the roller. So if you do that you're then distributing you're distributing the glue that is already on, on the veneer or on the substrate or whatever it is you're gluing up. So the, these are a very, very good way of spreading a controlled amount of glue relatively quickly, but more importantly, very evenly, um, which is what you want. And then it just sits in this little, um, little um, support when you're, when you're not using it. Okay. Now the glue, the glue we're going to be using is a urea formaldehyde resin. Now the reason that I use this for laminating guitar parts is that it has a very long open time so I've got no concerns about the glue starting to go off before I can get the layup onto the mould and into the press. Um, and by long long time I mean hours. I mean if you, if you're, you can do this process entirely cold um, and if you're doing that then you'd be leaving the, uh, the, the component in the press under pressure for you know possibly six or seven hours or, or overnight normally. Um, doing it with a heated press, you know, a heated uh, mould, means in actual fact uh, it's only going to be under pressure in the mould for about 30 minutes um, between it going in and it coming out fully cured. Um, UF resins also set very, very hard, I mean crystal hard. Um, and that, that's important in something like a guitar because uh, you, you don't want there to be a soft layer of adhesive anywhere or a, a layer of material that's significantly softer than the wood because that, that again will cause a dampening effect. Um, and UF resin cures entirely through a chemical process. So um, glues like tight bond and PVA, which I've seen people um, using for laminations, uh, they're water-based, so they're putting a lot of moisture into the, into the veneers on either side. And it's only through the veneer absorbing that moisture that the chemical reaction takes place in the glue line and, and the glue goes hard. However, that water is still there. So it means that 
Uh, it can be several days, possibly even a week, before that veneer lamination has got back to its original moisture content or, or the desired moisture content. Whereas with UF resin, there is none of that water absorbency happening. Um, the, 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 the adhesive is, is a, a two-part adhesive, um, which is a liquid resin and a powder hardener. And then we also add something called an extender powder. Now, it's, it's a slightly odd name for, for this particular component because it doesn't extend anything other than just makes the, you know, the volume of the glue larger. What it does do is it prevents the glue being squeezed through the pores of the veneer and, and coming to the surface. Um, so in actual fact, it's more of a pore blocker. Um, but it's a very important part of the process and, and it works tremendously well. Now all of the, all of the components in the glue um, are measured by weight. Show you scales. Yeah, so they're all measured by weight. So we've got a set of digital scales here. And I know that it takes approximately 100 grams of adhesive to, to glue up two sides with the four layers. Um, in each. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll mix up we'll, we'll mix up just over that, so probably 120 grams of resin and then the um, requisite mix of the, the powder hardener and the extender powder. Okay. <coughs> so this is, this is the resin. Um, this is the resin here. Um, prefer 4152. Um, and it, this can be used with a variety of hardener powders. So, depending upon the temperature in your workshop or the length of open time that you require, you can, you can pick different hardener powders to work with the same resin um, to give you a cure time. You know, I think they do three, so fast, medium and slow. Um, for, for most purposes, I'm using the, the, the medium powder. Um, so what we'll do, we'll put 120 grams of this in the, in the mixing pot. And you don't have to be, yeah, that's, that's just over 125 grams, but you know, you don't have to be absolutely super sort of chemistry lab precise with this stuff. Just, just get it probably within 5% of where you want. Okay, so this is the hardening powder. Now, what, what you often find with the hard, hardener powder is it has some reasonably big lumps in it. Okay? Now, they, they are quite difficult to mix into the resin. Um, it just takes a lot longer to do it. So what, what I normally do is I put it in through a sieve, um, so I'm breaking up the lumps as I'm putting it into the, into the resin. Okay, so we'll just zero that. Now, the, the ratio that we use, it's not just written on that one, the ratio we use is 100 parts resin, 15 parts hardener, 35 parts um, extender powder. So we went 1.2 1, 1 times, so we want 15 would be the 100. And then just a little bit over. Three grams, so we want about 18, 18 grams of the, of the hardener. And then what I'll do is I'll just push that through the sieve, I'll give you the overhead shot on there. Just push that through the sieve. Until all the lumps are broken up. And it's all gone through. Okay. So that's the hardener powder. Do the same with the, the extender powder. So the ratio would be 35 grams of this. So we're going to want about 42 grams of hardener. So I'll just zero the scales again, just to make it easy. We're going to have 42 grams into the sieve. Not to have, not tends not to have anywhere near as many lumps in it, um, so it's it's easier to, to get through the sieve. So just I say just stir it around. Try not to make too much mess. Oops. 
So. Turn the scales off, get them out of the way. And then what you do is you just start slowly mixing it together. Now, it looks like nothing's happening, but fairly quickly you'll start to see the, that the hardener and the, um, the, the resin, so the hardener and the extender powder are being absorbed into the, into the liquid resin. So you can see it's all starting to come together there now. And you just want to give it a, a really good mix. You can squidge it against the edge of the, the bowl. That's why I like using these silicon spatulas because they, they clean up very easily. But they're also really good for doing this kind of squidging. And what to do is look at the bottom edge of the container, um, the bottom edge of the container, and just make sure you can't see any little, you know, trapped, dry patches. Um, yeah, so that's that's looking pretty good. Okay, so now we just want to pour it into the into the glue spreader. Like so. to make sure we get most of that out because I'm, I'm being relatively mean with the mix quantity so there's not going to be a lot left over once I've glued up the, the two sides so the more we can get out at this stage the better. Because you've got such a long open time on this glue you know there's no there's no rush you know if, if you if you do a mix and you end up for whatever reason it comes up a little bit short yeah, that, that may even be the case this time, we'll find out. Um, you know, so you part way through gluing up a, um, a side, that, that really doesn't matter. You've, you've got the time to, to stop, do another mix, only take you a few minutes, um, and then top up the glue spreader and off you go again. Right, so what I'm going to do, I've just got an extra piece of MDF here um, that I'm going to use when I'm gluing the veneer, it just raises it up off of the off of the main bed. Just makes it easier to hold it in place whilst I'm, I'm, I'm gluing the material up. Now, what I've already done is mark mark the sides, the side veneers with. labels yeah. so that these are the two parts for the um, for the full side and then I've got similar labels on the two parts for the uh, cutaway side the internal layers obviously you don't need to worry about uh, marking them up and normally I do the the full side first um, if for no other, other reason than that's the order in which the moulds sit most comfortably inside the inside the vacuum press. Yeah. So I do the, the full side first. Now at the moment the face veneers are slightly over length. Um, so what I'll do, I know that the um, internal layers are cut to the correct length. So I'll just take them, lay them on top and just use them as a as a guide for trimming them. Trimming the figure so we'll make sure it's lined up at this end as well. Yeah, that's good. Get my scalpel. Yeah, let's just trim that down there. Now these, the 
sides I'm pressing at 135mm wide, which is quite a lot over where they'll end up being finished. Um, I think they end up getting trimmed back probably you know, 10 or 15 mil from there, maybe slightly more. Um, but there's no, there's no harm in, in pressing them wider. I mean, uh, it just gives you a bit more leeway when it comes to positioning on the, uh, on the mould. Okay. So what I'll do, um, the, the veneers are book matched. So what that means is that I'll find the one that's going to be the outer, the outer face for the full side. I don't know if we're going to be able to see that, but if I put that there, well, turn it over, it'll be easier. If I put that there, I don't know how easy it is to see, but that's actually a, 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 it's a book match joint there. So the, these were sequential leaves of veneer, so they'd have come off of the tree, you know, one, two. So if you open them out, you get the perfect line of reflection, the same as you do with solid, um, solid signs. The difference being that there is no material. Um, there's no material missing from between these two surfaces, so that the degree of match is significantly higher than you will um, often find with, with solid wood, where you've lost that three or four mil of material through the saw cut. Okay. So let's make sure I'm using the right pieces. So this is the bottom, so this is the, for the, the bottom of the guitar, the, the end of the guitar. Um, and this is the registration side, because this is where the two pieces are going to meet and you know, you'll, you'll see them you know, together on, on the bottom of the guitar. So I'll turn that over and I can start to glue that. I'll move this one out of the way. Okay. Now, when, when you're gluing this material, um, you don't need a lot of adhesive. You know, you can really be quite mean with it. Um, it needs to be an even coating, but you, you don't want to have a lot of excess glue to be squeezing out everywhere. So my, my advice is always put a little bit on, spread it around, and if you need to add a little bit more, then it's, a, it's very easy to add some. It, it's a bit of a drag to try to scrape glue off if you think you've overdone it. Okay, so maybe just a little bit more there. And you can see, you know, that there's, I'm now just moving around with, with the trigger um, released, so I'm just spreading the glue that's already there. Um, and I'm using, I'm using the light reflection to determine, you know, the thickness of the glue. Or how much how much adhesive is is in any one place? So that end that end bit's just a little bit dry, so we add a little bit there and roll it right to the end. If you see any little specks, just take them off. Okay, that looks that looks pretty good. That's a little dry spot there. And then just roll over that. And all we're doing is, here is we're just picking up glue from one area and moving it to another. We're not putting any more glue down at this stage at all. There's, there's enough glue there to do the job. Okay, so that's about right. So then get one of the cross grain layers and very carefully position that on top. You want to make sure it lines up as closely as you possibly can get it. And here what you do, you want to give it a good squidge down because we're now going to have to glue onto a cross grain layer. Um, and that's always slightly hazardous because if you go too fast or if your glue is particularly sticky, I know that sounds odd, but um, UF resin thickens up with age. So if you're using it near its use by date, it will be more viscous than when you, when you first buy it. Um, there is a danger that the, the cross grain layer tends to pick up and, and wrap itself around the roller. So what, what I'll normally do um, is I'll put the glue down by pulling it, you know, rather than pushing it, because that um, helps overcome that problem. And then what I'll do is when I'm distributing the glue, I'll do it at an angle and I'll do it a bit more slowly than if I was gluing a, um, a long grain layer. So 
again just a little bit more of this in, a bit dry. You can, you can see, you know, I can pick that, I can pick that up because of the stickiness of the, the glue. spots catching the light so the next the next layer goes on and the, these layers are over length as, as well as being over width so you know there's quite a lot of trim allowance on them and again just pull all the way down maybe one more time that looks like plenty to me and then just Of it picking up the, the veneer. If that happens, I'll need to need to um, need to look for the YouTube bleep button because it's really, really very annoying. So what we'll do once I've got this this layer finished. I'll just put it to one side. Um, so, no, no, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll put it straight onto the mould um, and then you can see how, how it's held on the mould and, and the, the various layers that we use on, on the mould, including the heater pad, there's a reflective layer and then there's a, a call layer, which is just a non-stick um, layer, which goes on immediately on top of the Okay, so that's done. That. Now, again, just make sure I've got the label um, marked up for the inside at the bottom. And you can see this, this is still very pretty uh, veneer, but it's not quite as cosmetically perfect. You know, it's got the occasional little knot and eye on it. On it. And it's, it's not a, a, a layer of material I'd use for the outside of a guitar. However, for the inside, you know, it's absolutely perfectly acceptable and will we'll make for a very, very pretty interior. So again, just lay that down on top, like that. Okay. Right. So I'll just move the glue spray for one second. Um, okay, so that's, that's, the first, that's the first layer of glue. If I get my mould, this is, this is one of the moulds that we're using today. This is awesome. Glue on there, get rid of that. This is one of the moulds. Um, it's made of made of MDF, um, six, six layers of um, moisture resistant MDF that have been machined on the CNC router. Um, it's got Velcro straps on it, which you'll see are really useful for holding the holding the material in position once we've um, once we've uh, got everything on there. Um, so what I do is. Just take those little straps and roll them back on themselves to keep them out of the way until they're needed. So this is double-sided Velcro, so it's hook on one side, loop on the other. It's very useful stuff for doing this type of work. Okay, like so. Right. So what we have here, this this layer here, um, I don't know if you can see, um, there's one layer that's got um, aluminium tape on it. It's just a heat reflective layer, and then we've got the silicon heater mat itself. Mm. See that better on the overhead. So this is a silicon heater mat itself, and you just about see in the light there the the element. So this is a wire element um, mat, and um, you can get them with an etched an etched element. Um, but in actual fact, that if if the heater mat's going to be folded and bent backwards and forwards quite a lot. The wire is actually a more resilient construction for the heater mat. And that's fixed onto the bottom of the, the mould with a couple of screws that also act as um, terminal connections to hold the, hold the um, power, you know, the, the electric um, 
power wires on, cables on. And then we have the call layer, which is just a piece of 0.8mm thick birch ply, cross grain, so it's very, very flexible. And this is this is PTFE, this is PTFE glass cloth. Um, so this is a, a, a fiberglass material that's been impregnated and coated with PTFE on both sides. So it's very, very highly non-stick. So what we do is we get the layer. Now this is where you have to make sure you put it on the right way up. Okay, not that I've ever, <laughs> not that I've ever got, got it wrong. No, seriously. Um, so that's why I always label things because um, it just makes it um, much, much more foolproof. So that that goes on here, and let me just go on to the little hero cam. You can see down here. There's actually this ledge, and that acts as the registration point, the stop point for the for the veneer layup. Um, there's also this trim mark here that's just indicating where the, the center line of the guitar is. So you can see there's probably 35, 40 mil of um, excess length on there. Okay, so to look, let me put on, on that one. No, that one. Yeah. So what we're going to do, um, I'm going to get a little bit of tape just to hold this end. Just put that across there like so. And then I'm going to push that right down onto that stop, yeah, just keeping it central on the mould. And then just going to pull that tape round. You don't, it doesn't need to be especially tight, it's, it's basically just to, to stop it slipping during the next stage. Okay. And then the call goes on, and that, that can just overhang very slightly. And then we just fold the, the heater pad layer over the top. Okay. And that's where these little Velcro straps are going to come in handy because now what I can do, I'm going to start with this one just to get it, get it fixed, is I can unroll them. Do this on the front. I can unroll them and that just really helps hold the, the layup in position whilst the mould's being manhandled and positioned into the, the vacuum press. Yeah, so that one, just push the material down. Stretch one strap over from one side, pull the um, other strap over the other side, and just do that all the way along. I'm sorry if I keep looking down to this side, because I've got a monitor here so I can see what's actually being recorded. So I'm, I'm doing this all my own today, so I'm having to um, monitor what's happening and, and press the buttons to, to switch camera views and so on and so forth. Some of which may get edited out if I can be bothered to do so. <laughs> right, so that, that's the first one all glued up. So put that to one side. Then we need to glue up the, the, the second side, the cutaway side. And the cutaway side is slightly shorter. Um, but again, I'll just check that I've got the, the labels at the same end. Yeah. So that's right. Um, and again, I need to trim these for length because they're, they're still slightly over length. So if I get the two internal layers for that, the cutaway side, and just do that. You can see the cutaway side is actually slightly shorter. You know, it gets pressed about 25 mil shorter than the, than the full side. I'm sorry if some of this is off, off camera, but I'll do this. I'll do this one again at some point. I'll do a better job of it. I'll have a, a cameraman with me. Maybe he can do zooming in and zooming out rather than just on and off. Right. So that's the, the face layer. So we'll glue that one first. Hopefully we're going to have enough glue. It's not even just about be okay. But like I say, it doesn't actually take much glue to do these. Um, you, you don't want to have a lot of excess glue squeezing out of the sides. Um, of these things. A, it's messy, and B, it just indicates that you've put too much glue on. Um, so keep it, keep it relatively mean, and uh, that ends up giving you a very strong but lightweight component at the end of it. Any of you are um, guitarmaking.co.uk members, then you may well have seen me do something very similar to this with Mark Bailey on his um, on his YouTube channel. 
Um, but you won't have seen me using the, the heated the heated moulds, which is quite an interesting um, development. Um, I watched um, I watched this demonstration on heat bending using his heat bender the other day, and the temperatures involved were just scary. Um, this is the, the temperature we're going to get up to on, on my moulds is probably 70 or 80 degrees, and then for, for 20 minutes. So it's, it's a much gentler degree of heat on, on the wood. You know, there's no chance of these things bursting into flames. Um, as per one story on the forum recently. Um, my, my website is actually being re, reworked as I speak by the same company who did Marks and it's not going to be a copy of Marks but it's going to incorporate certain similar aspects so there will be a user forum which is something I've desperately wanted for years. Um, so that, that will be happening within the next six to eight weeks and it will be going live. Okay, so it's again pulling to apply the glue onto the surface and then we'll go backwards and forwards. Now I'm not going to edit any of this gluing, glue spreading out because it's important for you to know how long to expect um, to expect this process to take. You know, this isn't this isn't a 30 second job, this is something you need to spend a bit of time on, you need to be careful with it, um, you need to make sure that the glue is even, um, because putting it in a vacuum press isn't necessarily going to um, sort that out for you. You know, it, the vacuum press is very good at applying pressure, but it, it can't squeeze thick layers of glue into thin layers of glue um, particularly well. So the the evenness of the glue spreading is entirely down to you. And you know, it's often worth just coming all the way down the full width of the the, um, the layup as a final as a final um, spread just to make sure. And again, you know, just use the light to check. You can see if there are any dry patches or any particularly thick patches, and that all looks fairly good. So on with the Next layer. And again, pushing it down like this really helps to prevent the, the veneer sticking to the roller and lifting up. Yeah, so they're absolutely fine on blue. We could have got away with 20 grams less, I reckon. But Now if for instance I was gluing this using, using a PVA or a tight bond, um, there would be no way that I could there would be no way that I could do both and put them in the press at the same time. Oh, I'd have to do them one at a time. Just because the glue will start to be absorbed by the veneer, the veneer will start to swell up because of the moisture um, absorption. And um, if you don't get it in the press within a couple of minutes of, of spreading the glue, then you know, you're, you're asking for trouble. Um, that, looks, that looks just about right. Again, just check the label. Put that on there, line it up. Press it down a little bit. Move it over and then pick up the the other mould. So again, it's exactly the same construction, six layers of MDF, um, heater pad, 
and the mold, the, both both the moulds have actually got a layer of that same PTFE glass cloth on the mould surface, which I'll show you in a second. Yeah, so we've got PTFE, we've got the same PTFE cloth on the on the mould as well, which gives a really, really nice, smooth, non-stick surface. And that, that's important um, because one of the things that the, the veneer has to do when it comes under pressure is actually slip and you know go into all of the indentations, all of the hollows on the mould, and it needs to be able to slip on the surface. If you've got a rough um, or, or, or grippy surface on your mould, then that isn't going to happen as efficiently and it can end up meaning that your, your layup doesn't completely conform to the shape of, the, of, of your tooling, of the, the former. Okay. So again, I'll just put that to one side, move the core there. And again, make sure I'm putting it on the right way up. Get a piece of tape. Set down nice and tight onto the stock, just wrap the tape around the sides, fold it over, put the core on again. Make sure everything's looking like it's going where it should do, where it needs to be. And peter it out over the top. So none of this should ever should ever be particularly panicked. You know, you've got plenty of time. Um, the glue on that first one is not going to be going off for you know four hours, five hours yet. So um, just take your time. You know you've got time to check that everything's going in the right place. Um, it's it's really not that exciting a process, or it shouldn't be. <laughs> Wrap your little straps around again. Now when, when this goes into the press, and I'm going to tell you this now because once the pump's running uh, there's going to be a bit of background noise, I'm not sure how the mic's going to pick it up yet. But once this goes into the press, it's actually a two-stage process. Okay? So what I do first is I'll just leave it under pressure for 10 minutes. Um, leave it under pressure for 10 minutes. Um, without the heat being turned on, without the heater pads being turned on. And what that does is it, it gives the, um, the material the opportunity to, to form as tightly into the mould as possible, for the adhesive to be squeezed into the grain of the wood um, without it having been activated, without it starting to go hard. So I'll give it 10 minutes of just pressure to, to fully bed down and fully settle down, and then I turn the power on to the, to the heater pads and leave that going for 20 minutes. And then I'll turn the heater pads off leave it another 20 minutes and then we can take the take the sides out. So there's going to be a few a few breaks in the in the filming bit. And here what I need to do is just make sure, I don't know if you can see that. Um, let me put a little GoPro, yeah. So you can see I'm just pushing that material hard down into the into the um, curve and then pulling the, the strap over the top. So you know this isn't this isn't holding everything in exactly the right position, but you know we're we're probably you know there's maybe a little bit of movement there or a little bit on the on here, but you can see that's probably 99 or well maybe 95 percent of the way to being um, completely wrapped around the mould, nice and tight. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the second one done. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to put this to one side. As per the first one, deconstruct my temporary bench so that I can get to the get to the vacuum press again. Okay, so I think you probably want to be on. Right, so now open the lid of the vacuum press. Now the full side mould goes on first, just because well you, you'll see why in a moment. So that goes on first. Um, one goes on and pushes right up next to it. Now the reason that I put the, the full side on first is because I want access I want access to this area so I can make sure that the membrane is tucked down really tight 
into here. Otherwise, we're not going to be getting the pressure on the on the layup in the in the correct um, position, or all, all the way across that that area of the the mould. Okay. So then, what I do is connect my terminals up. It's not a washer. Like so. And normally just give it a bit of crank with a spanner just to, nip, just to nip it up nice and tight. You need to come up to me a little bit. Now these heater pads um, run at 24 volts. So you know, we've got no mains, no mains voltage here at all. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not dealing with scary electricity. We're dealing with relatively benign, um, low voltages, um, low temperatures. There's nothing here that's going to um, going to catch fire and um, cause cause damage either to the either the guitar sides or your workshop or um, anything else really. Okay, so that's that done. So what we'll do now is close close the lid of the press. You can see now. Um, what I was talking about with the box membrane. Let me zoom out on that a little bit because that's yeah, that's better. Yeah, so you can see what I'm talking about with the the box membrane now. Um, there's plenty of material here. It's you know the, the lid's completely shut, um, but it's not actually pulling tight over the mould um, at all. Okay, so what I need to do is to make sure that when when I've shut the lid, I haven't trapped the membrane anywhere anywhere under the edge of the frame, so I just go around and make sure that um, you know, it's, not, it's not tucked under the lip seal, that all looks pretty good. And then what we're going to do is turn the pump on. So I have a foot switch for. Okay. But like I say, the most important thing now is that I get this, this membrane tucked all the way around the, the mould and into all of the recesses. Otherwise, you know, if it's stretching over um, a point and, and not pulling fully down into that area, then we're not going to be getting um, pressure on it. Now, I can already see that I've got too little material at the other end. And you, can, you can't really see that, maybe. That view, no, that view. Yeah, the, the, that's, that's no good. That needs to be able to, to suck fully into that side. So that, that's, that's part of the process. And again, you know, there's no, there's no rush. You know, if, it, if you suck it down completely to vacuum and you're not happy with it, just turn the vacuum off and then do it again. Um, tone of the pump change in a moment. Okay, that's, okay, that, that's, that's got it down to vacuum now. These moulds, um, the MDF moulds are actually partly hollow, so there's quite a lot of weight saving grooves being machined into the, in, into the internal layers. Um, and that's all air that's got to be sucked out, so it takes, it takes a few moments for it to get down to complete vacuum. And if we go over to the So that's all looking, it's all looking pretty good. Um, go over to yeah, still, still climbing, 1.6. I'm going to stop the, stop the recording now. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now and just go and wash, wash the glue spreader before the glue goes hard. And one really important thing to remember when you're washing your glue spreader that's being used with UF resin is do not use hot water because hot water will kick that glue off very, very quickly and you end up with big lumps of hard glue in your glue spreader, um, which is very tricky to get off. So I'll just use cold water, rinse it out, take it apart the same way as you saw, you know, reverse it when you're putting it together earlier, and then 
I'll be back in 10 minutes or so, at which point we'll turn the heater pads on. Okay, so that's, that's had 10 minutes now of being um, under pressure, cold. So what we're going to do now, straps you, you could just use adhesive tape to hold things in position um, but what I like about the straps is because they're not actually sticky they're not they're not preventing the the layup from moving at all so if it needs to slide a little bit to, to position itself correctly on the mold then it can it can do that okay let's lift that up um, now I don't know if you can see but there is virtually no no spring from the mould shape at all. I mean, a few mil on that end, and you know nothing on that end at all. So um, that's one of the beauties of laminating using you know thin veneers and especially using the UF resin is that the the component that comes off the mould is absolutely spot on to the shape of the of, of the mould, um, and the greater accuracy you can get in the production of the part at this stage. It just makes the next steps easier when you go to use the external mould to hold the sides whilst you're, you're molding in the neck block and the, the, the bottom block and um, tail block and installing the linings. Yeah, 
just lose that one. Now this, this particular shape of guitar with these two very tight bends on the um, on the cutaway, it does make it really quite a challenging shape to, to um, bend using a bending iron, using traditional sort of solid wood sides and, and heat. Um, but with the veneers, laminating the veneers, it makes that whole process much more straightforward, much more accurate. Um, much more reliable. You know, it's it's not impossible you get a failure um, using this, this me method, but um, it's considerably less likely than if you're, you're heat bending sides using a traditional bending iron, especially if you're using tricky woods, like I said, like the bird's eye maple, which is notoriously hard to, to bend. So again, you can see it's the, the, the finished component, um, and it is pretty much spot on the shape of the mould. I mean, there's um, virtually no deviation from the mould shape there whatsoever. Let's put one of these over. One of these over to hold the pads in place and I can move them out of the way. Okay, right, so let's have a look at what we've got here. Stick on the overhead. Um, the quality of the the lamination is excellent and I'm just running, if you run your fingers along it you, you'll be able to feel if there are any any spots where the glue or where the layers haven't been squeezed together properly and um, you will detect that as a thickening. There's nothing, nothing on there, on the cutaway side. No, that all feels very good indeed. What I'll do if I get the um, Get the little GoPro cam. Have a look at the edges here. Go around, and you'll see there's some very, very small little beads of glue here and there. And that, that's that's about as much as you ever want to see squeezing out of the side of a lamination like this. Um, if you end up with big, big blobs of glue floating around everywhere, it basically just means you used far too much glue in the first place. So again, a few little blobs on this edge. Um, yeah, that looks very good. A little bit more squeeze out there. And remember the, these uh, these sides are at least 10 or 15 mil wider than, um, than they need to be. Um, so they will get trimmed down quite a lot when they're um, in the, in the, fitted in the external mould. But overall um, I'm very happy with that. That looks extremely good. Um, I will also be doing some videos um, on other aspects of um, laminating the components. I'll probably do one on laminating the back, although that is considerably less exciting with it being um, flat. Although having said that, th there are two methods I use for, for laminating backs. One is just to laminate it completely flat, so you end up with a, 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 fl a flat lamination as you would if you were um, making a back up out of solid and then you rely on the bracing to, to form the, the curvature and also the shape of the, the rim of the guitar body itself. Um, or I have also pressed them in a dish, you know, a radius dish, um, in order to form some of that curvature um, as part of the laminating process and, and, and that works pretty well too. Um, not a lot in it really. Um, it's probably as, as simple just to, to do it flat and, and use the bracing and the shape of the body to, to form the curvature. Um, but there you go, that's how I go about making um, Macaferry laminated sides. Hope you've enjoyed the video and um, keep an eye on the channel for, for more videos coming soon. Thank you.